Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of Sea Hunters. And it is my pleasure to be here today in Bastyr. I'm just a short distance away from the Newtown Fisheries Complex. And right here we have the marina and our special, special guest today just happens to be a president. I know earlier on we had our first king, but now we are having a president on our show. Mr. Tuckett, welcome to Sea Hunters. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here uh, in the great uh, community of Newtown, uh, right in the heart of Bastyr. Uh, as we see the beautiful ambience of this natural marina that has been uh, afforded to us by Almighty God. And uh, we also, uh, as you just said, just a stone throw away from the Bastyr Fisheries Complex, of which the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society uh, hopefully will be taking control of to manage in the next uh, few years. And so it's a pleasure to be the president of this organization uh, that is over 50 years, uh, and we will continue to do our part in helping fishers. All right. As the president of the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society, tell us a bit about the history of this co-op, how it started, um, many of the challenges it faced, and of course, what's ahead. Thank you very much again for that question. So, as we all know, the Newtown community is a fishing community. Uh, from long standing. Uh, it, is, um, uh, uh, it is good to say, I will, I will gladly say, uh, probably it is one of the first fishing communities in the Federation of St. and Nevis of long standing. Uh, and we would have seen the establishment of the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society uh, sometime around in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, when fishermen decided that they would prefer to walk, work together instead of competing against each other, especially as regards to pricing and marketing their fish. Uh, we have in all, in all organizations some ebbs and flows. You will have some downtime, but you'll also have some real active time periods. And we would have gone through a restructuring uh, of the organization just about two years ago. And that is how come I came on board. Uh, I became president of the interim committee uh, uh, last year, uh, and we are moving towards uh, having uh, a more established, uh, right now we have about 120 members, registered members, and we are still growing. Uh, we invite all fishers, or any person, male or female, who are in, uh, involved in the fishing sector, whether you be on the sea, whether you actually sell on the road as a vendor, uh, even if you sell equipment or, or any sort of related fishing gear, you will be considered eligible for membership in the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society. Another important thing to note is that as we develop from year to year, uh, the Department of Cooperatives uh, decided to give us the geographical responsibility or the geographical uh, jurisdiction for all fishers from challengers all the way to k -On. So even though it's called a new town, which is new town, the community proper, we have the responsibility to not only uh, recruit, uh, but also to accept any person within that geographical uh, jurisdiction who would want to become a member of our co-op. So all fishers who are from Challengers all the way to Kayon, you can become a member of the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society, and we welcome you with open arms. Some of the challenges is always, uh, is always to have uh, the full involvement of all our members. So as I mentioned earlier, we have membership of about 120, but about, I would say, 10% of that, or maybe less, does most of the work. You always have that situation where you, know, have, yes, you have a large group, but then only a small group will come out whenever there's time to do work. But that doesn't phase us, you know. We know the responsibility as the leaders of the co that we have to do the work and we have to inspire other members to, to become part of any project that we are doing for the co-op. The, the good thing about cooperatives is that it's almost like a business where the profits 
are shared among its members at the end of the year uh, in the form of dividend. Now, if it is that you as a member do not participate to help the co-op succeed, then you are basically making it difficult for the co-op to give you your, your due dividend at the end of the year. But if all of us come on board and basically do our part, whether it be a fundraiser or event or to lobby in regards to any policy or to get any project or any funding, whether it be from government or regional or inter international uh, organizations or funding agencies, then it is when that will benefit all of us. But if we stay to the sidelines after we think we paid our $25 registration fee and our $100 shares and then that's it, no, you, you will just have a situation where the co-op, though growing, is not reaching to its full potential. So again, I would like to encourage all fishers, all women, especially who are involved in the fishing industry or the fishing sector, all uh, persons who have businesses that sell any fishing gear or equipment, you are eligible to become a member of this great Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society, especially if you live in the villages from Challengers all the way to Kayon, and all are welcome. Thank you. All right. Now, that's a lot of responsibility. I know you spoke about a wide area, and uh, the, the group started here in Newtown. I'd like to shift a little bit because um, we're moving out of this um, COVID era, so to speak, but now we are moving into another era, and we are seeing an increase not just a regular increase, but a sharp increase in the cost of fuel. I know that this would be a weight on each fisher. And I've seen some documents as it relates to bus, a bus association where they have already agreed to increase the cost of transportation. Now, are we expecting an increase in the cost of fish as well? Uh, what do you think can be done to mitigate this situation in which we find ourselves? Yes, thank you very much for the question. So, as we realize, uh, we were having some recovery from uh, the COVID pandemic. It was indeed a tough time for fishers at that time because even though we were still going out to sea, because you know, COVID doesn't really affect us out there, <laughs> we didn't have the market as we had before. Why? Uh, persons were not working. Uh, persons may have experienced a downsize in their business. So the, the disposable income was as not as much as we had before. And so persons were not buying as much food. Uh, and so a lot of the fishers for that two year period had a rough patch, as we all did in the world. Uh, but what we are seeing now in terms of the rise of fuel has to do with the global crisis uh, and conflict with Russia invading Ukraine. Uh, as you know, both of those two countries are major exporters of oil, and whenever you have a conflict of that nature, especially in that region, which is the source of most of the, 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 the world uh, crude oil production, you're going to have major, I would say, seismic, seismic uh, consequences, which we are now seeing uh, with 150 US dollars per barrel of crude oil. Now, in terms of your question, um, fishers go out every day and their lives are at risk. You cannot put a price on a man's life. As we know, last year we had some deaths of, within the fishing community. Persons were lost at sea. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a sad time when you see our fishers on a good day, you know, on a good day. But when you go out there, the sea could change on you just like that. You know, all of a sudden it looks nice and calm and then bam, 20 foot swells. So I said that to say that in regards to fishermen who are applying their trade with the intent to bring back fresh cash for our people, you know, it's hard to put a price on it. That is why even the Department of Fisheries and even the world uh, organization that deals with marine resources have it difficult to put a price on the uh, sale of fish as it is done for the cost of production for crops. It's much easier to come up with a cost, uh, a possible price for crops than it is for fishing because the man out there on his boat, yes, he pay gas, yes, he pay insurance for the boat, yes, he have to buy equipment, and yes, he has to catch bait and he spend hours on the sea, but his life 
is a different thing. Now, we and the fishing uh, community, and especially as president of the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society, we're endeavoring to try to keep the cost as it is presently. Uh, what we are doing is talking to our fishers, explaining to them the, uh, the, the delicate balance between the market that we are trying to keep that sustains us, while at the same time keeping our costs down. But how can you keep costs down for a major input of your production when you have no control over that? And you need gasoline, you need diesel. You can't go back to sales, <laughs> you know, even though you might, people might say, well, yeah, do that, go back and use the sales, but it's difficult. It's, it's not as easy as one, two, three now. So what we are trying to do is to negotiate with the government to see how best we can have subsidies in regards to the fuel costs. We are also in discussions right here in Basel Fisheries Complex uh, to try to have one of the major oil, uh, well, a fuel uh, distributors, which is uh, Delta uh, Petroleum, to go into an arrangement where we will manage the, the, the gas and diesel depot, which is right here at the marina, and that will see members of the co-op having uh, concessionary rates uh, once they buy from the co-op. Uh, of course, if you're not a member of the co-op, then you will buy the normal rate. But that, again, is another benefit of becoming a member of the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society. So when we are tasked with the management of this facility, as was the initial uh, uh, intention when this uh, facility was built by the Japanese government, it was intended that we, as the Newtown Fishers Cooperative, would have taken it over. But we were not ready at the time. Right? Uh, and so we are now building our capacity to be able to uh, manage this facility. But uh, with the help of the Department of Marine Resources and Dr. Mark Wilkins, I'm sorry, Dr. Mark w Williams and all of his other uh, of, uh, officers within that department, we will see that the Delta Petroleum uh, uh, depot, a fuel depot, will be operational again and we will endeavor to take that over and then we'll see concessionary rates. The real, real, real solution to the problem is for Russia to uh, come out of Ukraine uh, and for this conflict to cease uh, and to have some level of normalcy. It is sad to see that we just came out of a two-year fight and war, I would say, battle with COVID, and now and the people are getting ready to breed and we see the ships coming back in and the economy is starting to you know, rebound and then bam, this crisis. So you know, I, I would like to plead to uh, President uh, Putin uh, please, as you, if you can, quickly resolve this matter uh, for the sake of the people of Russia and Ukraine and for the sake of the world, and let us not have any further uh, conflict that will raise the cost of living or even put any life at risk. All right. You said quite a bit, but I would like to pick at, at a specific point. You made a comparison between fishers and farmers. And this is something that I have expressed um, some concerns about in terms of how um, allocations are made. Uh, a farmer, it is easy to evaluate what a farmer has and would have lost. But when we're looking at a fisher, you can count certain things based on a monetary value, but then every time he leaves port, his life and the life of all of his crew members are at risk. Now, the name of this show is Sea Hunters, and that speaks true to what they are and what they do. They are hunters while farmers are planters. Yes. Can you speak a little bit more on that so that the general public who are viewing this program could have a clear and decisive understanding that there is a huge, significant difference between agriculture and fisheries? Yes, well, uh, I'll do my best. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as you rightly said, uh, the fishers are hunter, right? Hunter gatherers. <laughs> Whereas uh, you would say that the farmers or the crop farmers or those who are involved in direct agriculture are gatherers. So 
and and the medium by which the fishers go out to ply their trade to bring back another source of quality high protein quality high protein uh, in our fish products products is that they have to go out on a in an environment that is unstable unreliable uh, and very dangerous I, I i can't say that why it's dangerous uh, because even if you were to have gps or have a lifeboat or a dinghy or have a, a life vest you can be right 10 feet away from someone and you can't find them and the sea is so vast as we know the world is made up of two-thirds water and one-third land so you can find a man who's lost on the earth yes. but it's twice as hard maybe three times as hard to find a man who's lost at sea so that's just one point but the, the, the major point is that in regards to the person who goes out it is not a guarantee when he goes out he will catch fish so each time he fills up his tank with fuel at now eighteen dollars a gallon maybe nineteen by tomorrow who knows god's willing maybe god forbid and he goes out and he throws his line or he trawls or he puts down his fish pot there's no guarantee that he will get any any fish or any lobster or any conch or if he goes on and dive Diving again is another point. If you go diving, you could get bends. Yes. If even the best diver have experienced bends, and bends is a devastating, life-threatening situation. Persons have died because of the bends. And so I said that to remind the difference between fishers and agriculturists or farmers. Farmers, at least, when they put a seed or two in the ground, it will grow. It will produce something, and they could always find it there. If you put on your fish pot, you might not sure you're going to find your fish pot, even with, like, with, like I said, with all the, with all the, the buoys and all of the, the, the GPS. So that's the risk. The level of risk is higher, right? And the level of uh, the cost import of, in, in, uh, of inputs is not as high, per se, in terms of fishers, between fishers and farmers. As we know, to plow a, pl a plot of land is $175. But to fill up a 20-gallon uh, tank, to go 20 miles out and back is about 600, yes. right? So again, uh, 100 and something to plow an acre of land, maybe 200, maybe 300. But to go out to where the fish are biting mm -hmm. is six and $800, right? For each trip, or maybe two trips, yeah. right? So that's, again, it shows the, 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 the high cost. So again, it is not as easy as one, two, three, and the reason being, uh, that we can continue to, to think that the cost of fish is too high and we should try to have price control. To do that, you're going to be actually forcing the small industry that we have in terms of the fishing industry out of business and then you'll force persons to try to import. The difference, or the things that we need to do to improve the situation are these. One, fishers need to become more involved in trawling, have trawlers. Instead of going along, as you can see, these small boats, uh, we have to move away from that. Uh, we have to go now with bigger trawlers or two we also need to continue continue to work together in cooperative movements like the Newton Fishers Cooperative Society and, and, and lastly if I may add we have to always always remember that when we are marketing we have to include value added so when you increase the opportunity uh, of the fisher, not just to sell the whole fish, but to sell fillet, or to sell fish sticks, or to sell sort of fish balls. It actually helps, one, the longer storage of your fish. Two, uh, you get another variety of added value uh, for a particular market sector that's looking for fish sticks instead of just sliced fish, or instead of just fillet fish. Uh, and you can also increase the value. So you get more for your money in terms of your fish. So maybe a whole fish was $10, for one fish, but for the filler, you might get 20 or 30, you know. So these are the type of things that fishers will have to do in terms of trying to diversify their sector and to become, uh, increase their income. But at the same time, like you rightly said, there's a difference and uh, the, 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 the general public has to understand. It's very risky. It's life-threatening, unlike it is here on land. And 
it's not a surety that you will get something when you go out. Unlike on land, you're sure to get something unless a pest or a hurricane destroy it. But and also the inputs is much higher, the cost of inputs. And I would like to add something else to that. Um, when a crop is lost, even if the farmer doesn't have insurance, they would generally receive some assistance from either the government, the Department of Agriculture, or some sort of NGO. When a fisher loses his vessel, many a times it's, it's like um, tough luck. Um, we have friends in Asia, and I know some of those countries would decommission fishing vessels based on international regulations on the number of fishing vessels allowed in a particular fishery at a particular time. Now, I'm wondering if through um, diplomatic ties, do you think that it is um, feasible for us to gain access to some of these vessels which would normally become scrapped? Very, very good point. Of course it is possible. But you see, the government or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs would not venture into such discussions if you don't have a group to receive it or who is organized to receive it. So you organize, you have diplomatic uh, discussions and, and you, you negotiate to get three trawlers, good trawlers, good engines, and then you pack them up there by the port, deep water port, but who going to run them? Fisherman still saying, but I ain't staying out now for two weeks or three weeks and then left me woman and you look no problems. Or they say, no, nah, 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 I ain't staying out so long, I want party on the weekend. So the point is we have to have a change of culture in our business operations uh, and our business model of fishing or in the fishing industry or the fishing sector here in the Caribbean, especially here in St. Kitts and Nevis. So that, again, is why the Newton Fishers Cooperative Society, as we grow and develop, we will be the ones who will direct the government or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to say, yes, we are ready. We do want to have a trawler. We do have a crew already who's willing to go out for two and three and maybe four weeks out to a month out there and to do what is necessary to bring in high quality uh, fish produce, but not just for our local market, but to export. And that will help to bring in foreign exchange, that will help to reduce the import bill, and that will means all good for, for our people because now they're eating even healthier. Now, in relation to the issue of uh, the issue of whether or not we are ready, it's a, it's a process. It's a process. I mean, it, it was only about 20 or 30 years ago we started to see a change from oars to engine. It was only about 20 to, to 10 years ago we started to see a change from netting to, to trawling with lines. So it, it, it's, a, it's all about a process. Again, too, our fishers are aging. Uh, we need to encourage and to recruit more young people into the business of fishing. Uh, and this is something that is important. Not to show them, not only to show them that, hey, uh, the fishing sector is a viable option for uh, building wealth, and also uh, to uh, alleviate the strain on the government to employ people into the government sector. But it is a means by which we can have safe food and healthy food, another protein substitute. So we need to do more to encourage, to make, as this young people say, make fishing look sexy, and so that they can become uh, entrepreneurs. And then we will see a, a greater, uh, in great, greater creation of wealth, uh, decrease of the importation bill, and increase in foreign affairs, foreign exchange. All right. Now that we've dealt with that, um, and I liked your answer. I really like that answer. We need to be ready. So, fishers, get ready. He's ready, and he's leading a team. Join his team so that we can all be ready and we can all have that safe, nutritious food to eat. Now, on to your trip. Yeah. Um, I believe it was last year we had a conversation and you said you were going to visit the motherland. Yeah. So, please tell us what happened while you were there and how does that impact on um, the Newtown Fishers organization moving forward yes thank you so i i, I went to ethiopia uh, and as you know in the caribbean ethiopia has a very cultural a very strong cultural and spiritual 
uh, linked in our consciousness, not just because of Rastafarianism, but we, we, we've seen even young people who are not Rastas, who have never had an affinity to Rastafarianism, are still aff uh, 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 affiliating themselves to uh, the image of His Imperial Majesty Emperor Anna Selassie, or the ice green and gold colors, or even the uh, medallion with, uh, that is shaped in Africa. So there's a consciousness that is never going to die because it is in our DNA. And so Ethiopia, which we all know is uh, mentioned in the Bible over 300 and something times. Uh, it also is uh, the seat of the African Union. Uh, again, it is a con uh, the only country that has never been colonized in, in Africa. So I can go on in terms of the historical perspective and geopolitical perspective uh, and the spiritual perspective of Ethiopia. So I went there uh, because I, I'm also a member, uh, a practicing member of the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, church which is the oldest christian church in africa and one of the oldest christian churches in the world uh and and so i went for for three things one to as a spiritual uh uh excursion uh two to represent the university of west indies as i am the president of the ue global ue alumni association which is 350,000 strong uh, and growing because each year our university have about 30 to 40,000 graduates coming out. Uh, and also to represent, uh, of course, the uh, agriculture and fishing community. So let me give you the perspective of what has tra what transpired in terms of the, uh, the question you've asked. So I went to the uh, African Union and I met with the Director for, of Agriculture and the Blue Economy. The Blue Economy has to do with marine resources. Uh, and uh, through that discussion, I was able to uh, help the Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources through the Permanent Secretary, uh, Bishop Ron Collins, to make a link with uh, the director. And they're going to be having, hopefully, uh, some meaningful discussions that will lead to uh, linkages and an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding between the African Union, uh, which represents 53 African states on the mother continent and how that will uh, link to St. Kitts and Nevis in relation to trade, in relation to uh, uh, transfer of uh, technology, uh, transfer of ideas, uh, and also to sharing uh, cultural experiences in regards to the fishing industry and of course our culture. And so I also met with the director for the uh, Cooperative Society. Uh, they are in Ethiopia, and they have large cooperatives. Now, the difference with Ethiopia, Ethiopia is landlocked. Uh, it does not have direct access to the sea, uh, but it does have a lot of lakes, some very large lakes, and so fishing is done on the lake, so it's fresh water. Uh, but they also are involved in aquaponics, uh, and so that is a major, where they do lobsters, they do shellfish, they do uh, shrimp, they also do uh, tilapia by aquaponics. And that is something that we can learn from them. On. And so uh, those are things that we are looking to see we can benefit from. And so the large cooperatives, they have cooperatives that actually engage in those type of activities. So the idea is that we will have uh, an exchange of, of fishers coming from Ethiopia to uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, and also some of our fishers going to Ethiopia uh, to have that cultural experience and to see what they are doing on the ground. Uh, and of course, like I said, the, uh, Ethiopia is the seat of the African Union. So it's not just Ethiopia, but once we would have made that link with the director of agriculture and, and the blue economy, we then have access to Ghana, Kenya, uh, all the African states. And then we can see how we can uh, advance our networking uh, to benefit from those uh, connections that we will make. I'm quite impressed. Um, it isn't every day you hear someone from our federation speak so um, intelligently and no, passionately about a linkage between our federation and Africa and the various nations that are therein. Um, I think you would have done us proud. I don't, know, I don't know how intelligent <laughs> I am, but uh, I'm just a servant of the people. And you have one life to live, uh, and you have to live it well. Uh, you have one body, you have to take care of it well. Uh, and I would encourage you have one mind and you have to use it well. So I you know I would like to encourage persons based on where they are. Not everybody can be a doctor or a lawyer, not everybody can be a businessman, but whatever you are good at, even if it's one thing, use it for the benefit of yourself, of your family, of your community, and by extension of your nation. And then you will have a very productive life. And that's all I'm trying to do with whatever talent God has given me. Uh, 
wonderful response. And it was nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you. And ladies and gentlemen, when I came to St. Kitts for the first time and I met him, I didn't know that he was my neighbor. He actually grew up right next to my grandfather here in St. Kitts, yes. and he recognized, he recognized my family trait, yes. which is the big nose, yes. the moment he saw me. The handsome face, the handsome face, the handsome face. All right, um, so Mr. Tuckett, any final words? But please feel free to mention your business so that persons would know how to contact you or what type of business you're involved in. Yeah, well, the only business I'm here to, to promote right now is the Newtown Fishers Cooperative Society. Uh, and I would like to encourage all persons who are listening to this program, whether you're in St. Kitts or in Nevis or any other part of the world, if you are involved in any type of fishing activity, get involved in a cooperative or some association. Uh, I would like to big up uh, the other corps and associations in the Federation. You have the Sunday Point Fishers Corp, you have the Old World Fishers Corp, you have the Deep Bay Fishers Corp, you have the Newcastle uh, Fishing Association, uh, and, I, and I know all of these good gentlemen who are working hard and tirelessly without pay uh, to, in, to move the industry forward for the benefit of each fisher uh, in the community. And so I would like to encourage all of you to become part of your, your, your local uh, association or, or cooperative. Get involved and you will see great things happening. Uh, and as uh, for us here in St. Kitts with the Newton Fishers Cooperative Society, I would like to encourage all of the members. We have a great event coming up. That's on Easter Monday. That's Monday the 18th of April 2022, right here at the Bastia Fisheries Complex. will be the first annual Bastia Fish Fest. We're going to be having it starting from 12, 12 p.m. Uh, until 1 a.m. We have EK and we have Hellfire Sound and we have Small Axe Band that are on the cards as entertainment. We're going to have aquatic sports. We're going to have grill fish, fire fish with Johnny Cakes. And it's going to be a family day. And we encourage all to listen out and to come out. That's on Easter Monday. Easter Monday, that's Monday the 18th, April 2022, right here at the Bassway Fisheries Complex. It's going to be fun, fun, fun. And we hope to see you there. It was wonderful having you here as a guest on the show. And um, I'm wondering if I should um, organize with the, the bakery that I contacted before and get some conch bread. I don't know if you've heard of conch bread before, but it's, it it's a product that um, I came up with and I partnered with a baker at Eastern Bakery oh. to put on the market just for persons to sample. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have the event that we wanted to have because of the various lockdowns. Yes. But hopefully, the conch bread will be back. I don't know if we'll we could work something. Yeah, oh, all right. So he's invited me over yes, to yes. bring the conch yeah, bread right to Saint Kitts. Yes. So, Saint Kitts, get ready. The conch bread is what it is coming. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it was wonderful being here um, at Fisherman's Grill right here at Bastia Fisheries Complex. It's a lovely location. If you're ever in the area and you need something to eat or drink, please feel free to stop by and it's a wonderful atmosphere. So I would like to thank the owners and I would like to thank my guests, my neighbor, Mr. President, for being here today and as always, I'll catch you next time on Sea Hunters.